Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello, and you're very welcome, and thank you for being here today for our study morning. Uh, Patrick Graham is widely regarded as one of Ireland's most influential contemporary painters, and as highlighted in the text accompanying the exhibition, Graham's heroic subjects are imbued with a fundamental human desire to communicate, and his compositions present multiple possibilities of interpretation. As you will see from the schedule, each of you has, we have a wonderful programme of guest speakers this morning. And in organising today's programme, I would like to uh, thank in particular my colleague Cleo Fagan, Education Curator, as well as Catherine Neville and Kayla Brzezinski and each of our guest speakers for participating. We are very grateful to Professor Declan McGonagall for chairing today's study morning. Declan McGonagall is, curator, uh, is a curator and writer focusing on relations between art and artists institutional practice and public value. Formerly, he was curator of the Orchard Gallery in Derry, the ICA Exhibitions Programme in London, director of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, and has served as Irish Commissioner for the Venice and uh, São Paulo Biennales. He was shortlisted for Tate's Turner Prize and has served on the Turner Prize jury at other national and international awards panels. He is currently curator of Dublin Port's engagement program and was recently appointed to the board of the Hugh Lane Gallery. So I hope we have a lovely morning and I would like you to please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Declan McGonagall who will start this morning's proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Thanks. And thanks very much for the invitation to chair today's uh, uh, event. Um, can I also just thank the Hugh Lane and the curatorial team who put together this, uh, I think, really stupendous exhibition of Patrick Graham's work. Uh, it must be the largest, uh, Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, but the largest gatherings of his work, certainly that I've seen, and that has taken place here. Um, and it, it really bears um, that sort of attention. His practice bears that sort of attention. Um, uh, it's, it's almost a retrospective that is not retrospective because this is, this is no easy trip down memory lane uh, by any means because the work is incredibly meaningful in the present tense. And, and I mean literally in the, uh, in the present uh, set of upheavals that we seem to be going through uh, politically and socially at the moment. Um, as I say, it's terrific to see so many paintings here. I'm, I'm familiar, obviously, over time with a lot of uh, Patrick's paintings, but uh, what I was struck particularly by uh, was the uh, series of works on paper, the drawings, I think, are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I think of drawing actually as a way of thinking, and what's demonstrated alongside the paintings is, if you like, uh, Patty's mind at work. Uh, pulling images, of, if you like, off his own nervous system, uh, and which then obviously feed into paintings as well. Um, and I would expect no less powerful contributions from today's speakers. It's a, a wonderful group of uh, speakers who will be uh, starting to uh, talk to you uh, very shortly. Um, and what they will provide is a series of different perspectives, not just on Patty's work, but on the reservoir of ideas um, uh, and meanings which Paddy draws on uh, to make his work. Um, I think everybody knows the saying, the price of freedom is constant vigilance. Um, and in some ways, over the span of a working life, um, I think uh, Paddy has been vigilant on our behalf. Uh, and what he's been vigilant about, I think, is the issue of colonization and the... Uh, the, the reasoning behind colonialism. And I don't just mean the historical trope of English colonialism uh, in relation to Ireland, but uh, I, I'm talking about the recolonization of Ireland, which took place after independence by the Catholic Church. Um, this was not an accidental process uh, in Ireland. It was actually uh, a strategy, uh, uh, arguably conceived by Cardinal Cullen in the late 19th century. Uh, who redisciplined the Catholic Church, centralized the organization of the Catholic Church as a corporate entity that was prepared and would be capable of taking control of Irish society uh, in a post-revolutionary period, which was expected in the 19th century. So uh, the, the role of the Catholic Church in the 1920s onwards until very recently 
uh, and it hasn't gone away, you know, um, as we've seen in other, in, in, in other jurisdictions. Um, uh, it was not accidental that uh, their interest was in education, health, and uh, welfare, because those are the fundamentals uh, of uh, where values are created and gestated and could be, can be controlled within the making of a society. Uh, that is uh, a, a colonization process. And by colonization, I mean the denial or actual removal of agency from individuals and or communities on the basis of uh, sexuality or gender, of ethnicity, of politics or religion, the removal of agency from the other, however the other is defined. That's the essence of colonialism, it's the essence of a colonization process, and that is really what went on. Um, and, and Paddy, among I think a whole range of artists of his generation, have been engaged in that process of responding to that, those colonizing forces, those controlling forces. Uh, uh, a, a, a difficult process in, in those decades um, when the church was very powerful and the social expectations were built around that sort of central uh, principle. Uh, and I would argue that the sort of upheavals we're going, we're going through at the moment in the world are really to do with some people's attempts uh, to uh, create a new colonialism and new ways of removing agency from the other, again, no matter how you define other. Um, and I think, as I said, Paddy's work in the present tense, even though the works are from the past, is fully engaged still in responding uh, to those forces. Uh, Paddy, as a, as a painter, uh, works within, but at the same time against the Western tradition and the aesthetics of painting. And that creates the tension that seems to me to be at the heart of the quality of his work as an artist. That tension, that dialectic between working within a language and yet resisting the allure of the language and being able to do that. And I, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, speakers for today, uh, I would say that they are also engaged in responding to those forces of colonization in their very different ways and in different contexts. But it's very clear from even the short bios, uh, the, the breadth of their engagement with the society in, in which we all live um, and which requires the, the art sector, so-called, to step up to that sort of engagement. And um, these, these um, individuals, these speakers, obviously do that, Michaela and Jessica and uh, Theo, and Grace and uh, Michael and Anne-Marie. Um, they, they all do that, as I say, in very different ways. And I, if I could just ask now on Michaela Gataya to speak to us first in response to uh, Patty's work. Thank you. Good morning. Right. So, first, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be here and talking with you this morning. Um, so yeah, first I have to say that it's a bit intimidating first to be opening the, <laughs> the session and, uh, and engaging with the work of uh, Patrick Graham. Um, I realized that um, a lot of you have, as uh, Declan just reminded us now, like the, the history, the engagement, how of kind of many of you have a long kind of familiarity and intimacy with the work, which I don't. Uh, I mean, I know of Patrick Graham, and it is uh, kind of some of his image, but I don't have this sort of tight relationship with him. So uh, I came to the work, bringing my own my own reflections and my own perspective that I've been kind of that have been preoccupying me. Uh, in the last few years, and uh, I found that it actually brought in quite a number of um, synergies and uh, insights, uh, which I hope will not be too <laughs> sacrilegious <laughs> uh, and interesting enough. To, um, so the t two things have been uh, kind of uh, on my mind a lot in the, the uh, one of them uh, after the lockdown is to, I mean, 
to, to think about, again, what it is to be in a gallery, what it is to be standing in front of paintings, to be looking at paintings, to be looking at artwork in a gallery space, as opposed to sitting at home uh, in a kind of either on your screen or on a book or in a book. So, uh, I mean, obviously, this is something that is always <coughs> uh, kind of an ongoing consideration. But uh, spending a large part of two years uh, not going to gallery as kind of we. Um, uh, you know, like kind of like brings me whenever I am in a gallery, kind of like what it is, what it is, and what what difference does it make? So that's one consideration that I uh, that I have been kind of carrying around with me, walking around this quite impressive exhibition that has kind of brought in a lot of work. So, uh, what difference does it make for me looking at the publication and being there? So, so that's one of the one of my trades, and. The second one uh, is kind of, uh, at the moment I am, uh, for the last few years, I have been exploring this notion of superficiality and surfaces, and uh, in a sense of uh, uh, kind of looking at it through our language and how, how that might kind of be a way of thinking about how we are in the world. And obviously, surfaces seems like an obvious one for painting. And so that's kind of how um, kind of the, the thinking about looking, looking at some of the, the, the work of Patrick Graham and being confronted because I haven't been really, uh, I hadn't been really been thinking about painting specifically when I was um, researching surfaces, but obviously uh, paintings is about surfaces. So um, there was two, so that's kind of where my, my title come from. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a riff on the, this, this, um, this notion of the, the king's two bodies. So the title of my talk is The Two Surfaces of Painting. So that um, the, the king's two bodies is, uh, so I mean, like it is a well-known notion in, uh, uh, in historical studies. Uh, it's coming from, so I checked, I, I knew the notions, I didn't know it has been written in 1957 by Ernst uh, Kantorowicz. It's basically that the, 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 the kings, has, uh, like there is the, the, the body natural of the king and the body political. The king is dead, long live the king. So uh, like often with kind of like when I found titles, they sort of spring into my head and then they start kind of getting charged. And as the more I sort of explore this notion of, uh, because of, of my surfaces, and the, the bodies, I started to see a number. So I, I'll see how far the analogy can go, but I'll come back to that at the end. But my two surfaces essentially were uh, like in the kind of like the, the starting point of, of my reflection on surface was uh, um, a reflection by Friedrich Nietzsche uh, enjoining artists to stop bravely at the surface. And this. This struck me because uh, at the time, because I was also thinking about fossil fuels and about how digging is sort of digging our grave. And so the notion of surface, to stop at the surface, felt like it was not just about artist work, that it could as well be extended to, to other way of being and a way of interacting with the world. So to stop bravely at the surface. When Nietzsche wrote that, uh, he wasn't thinking of painters specifically, actually he was thinking of artists more generally, and Wagner, I think, in particular. Uh, he was a big fan of Wagner, and uh, he had loved his, uh, his early opera as a sort of life-enhancing work, and uh, he got really upset. Uh, towards the end, where Wagner started to drift towards uh, religiosity and spirituality and starting to load his work away from sensuality towards more kind of what Nietzsche qualified ascetic values. So basically, Nietzsche is kind of like artists should stay away from, from preaching and from moralizing and that they should stick to the surface. And when he talks about the surface, here he's talking about the world, the phenomenal world, the sensuality of the world, um, how the, 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 the world of appearance. Uh, and, um, and obviously, then that brings us to painting, which obviously has always been engaging uh, with that and, and, and uh, the visual art in kind of a 
<clears throat> famously, for example, Platon uh, denying their validity because because they were uh, they were mimic, kind of in mimetic <laughs> of the world of appearance, appearances that were of lesser value than ideas, than, uh, so that's, there was a div, kind of like, because painting or visual art generally was attached to reproducing the world, the world of appearance, uh, it was of lesser value because it didn't engage with the real stuff. As we know, appearances is lies, is and untruth, it's deceptive, it's all this. So this is why Christianity loved it so much. <laughs> the, um, the, so the painting has always been something to struggle with this uh, uh, because it engaged with the surface of the world. But then painting is also the surface of the painting. It is a surface. It is, uh, it is a canvas, it is a panel, it is a wall that is being covered in marks and uh, brush strokes that are oily, that are uh, watery, that are scrapped that are uh, uh, kind of tinned down and washed. And uh, the, the, so this, this and, and painters have been struggling with that surface as well, because then you have that three-dimensional world around them and that two-dimensional surface on the canvas. And so that's kind of the endless struggle. struggle. <laughs> How do you get these two to work together? Uh, at least since the Renaissance, that has been kind of like the ongoing battle. How do you make these two come together? Uh, and uh, and the, 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 the whole kind of, um, and, and you see how, uh, especially after kind of towards the, the end of the 19th century uh, and all modern art is about kind of reconciling the, 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 surface, the surface of the canvas and, uh, and, uh, and the world. And some, uh, some painter decided to go completely abstract and often painters actually that had sort of spiritual leaning and that were kind of unmooring themselves. They couldn't escape the sensuality of the canvas itself in any case, but they still, uh, they, they sort of gave, gave up on the representation. But many artists, and I think Patrick Graham is a very good example of that because you can see all the struggles in his work, the struggle with representation which he never, I mean, like you can see, sometimes it comes very close to abstraction, but never quite. And there is always these, these little kind of elements, this anchoring that kind of brings you back to the world, to, 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 to appearances. There's always a flower somewhere or something that, that kind of pull you back. So it's never completely abstract. And yet you can feel like the whole, uh, the whole struggle about how to engage with this representation, how to make it, uh, how to make it happen on, on, in paint. Uh, and then the, the, the struggle with the canvas itself, which in the 80s uh, work is particularly violent. It feels like there was really a battle going on about what do you do with this, with this material, with this surface. And, and almost kind of become, I mean, it actually becomes a sculpture uh, in some of the work where it's uh, sort of ripping it up, the, the sort of the two dimensionality kind of having, you know, like t taken, uh, taken it away. So it just, so those two notions of surface, I feel, are uh, kind of uh, particularly um, well explored and come vividly alive with the, with the work of, of Patrick Graham. So that kind of helped me has my way into the exhibition uh, that um, I'm looking at the work with these, these, uh, these things in mind. Uh, so the, um, coming because I, again, I don't have a long history with him, so I don't have a particular attachment to, so I'm coming sort of fresh to all the work as I was kind of walking in the, the gallery. It's a, there is a lot of works and of very different uh, covering quite a large period. And uh, so I have to say that my, uh, <clears throat> my leaning goes towards the later work. And it feels, I've, I've, I've noticed I generally like late work uh, in kind of art history. I often have a sort of leaning towards the later uh, work. But I, um, I, in this case, that was particularly so. Uh, I mean, it felt like the, 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 the 2020, 2021 were probably those that I loved best. Uh, I kind of like, I had immediately a feeling towards it. So the few that I will kind of like go into more details are from this uh, later period. I do find like the, the, the 80s work a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> the, uh, and it, it kind of like, it's, it is extremely, um, 
striking. And uh, but I don't, I don't, it didn't feel the same sense of connection. Also, it felt like the later work really uh, sort of touched on on something uh, much more directly um, to some of the the, the 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 kind of the aspect that I was interested in, and that I. I so the um, what so, so kind of like the first I mean I, su I suppose it's a kind of uh, one one thing that is striking especially when you're standing in front of the canvases is to see the, the how the the different form of treatments and uh, and the, the the kind of like depending on parts of the canvas whether it's uh, like the the uh, kind of like the thickness and the thinness and the, the, all these different and sort of some parts seems to be washed away and some part have been kind of like laded on like kind of thickly so there is, you have all this um, <clears throat> this engagement with the with the material and with the surface that is that makes the the, the uh, that makes it quite fascinating to look uh, to look closely kind of the, the um, also, I've started kind of like spending, uh, kind of looking certain certain uh, characteristic. Um, there is, um, I think, it was one of the essays that mentioned uh, a, a centrifugal force. Which, when I read the essay, I wasn't really, I didn't really, really catch on. But kind of looking, spending time with the work, uh, there really is something like that. There is kind of like it seems to live on the edges. Uh, the more you go to the edges, the more is happening. Um, and actually, a, a, a few, there was a couple of work, like uh, Landscape 2020 and um, uh, Half Light, I think the second one, uh, that actually as, as a piece of raw canvas in the middle, the canvas is actually uh, untouched. Uh, well, just maybe a bit of scribble, but essentially the, the, it's empty in the middle, whereas the, the, the sides, there is um, there is kind of a lot of writing. There is a lot of the, 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 the letters. Often the brightest colors are on the edges of the painting. Um, you know, something that recurs with work is those those large strips of of color, kind of like very strong color, like the green and yellows. Often at the bottom, uh, again, kind of like drawing our attention to to the edge and the margin rather than the center. And, and obviously, it's kind of like this whole notion of center and border. I mean, this is something again that has been in painting because um, perspective tended to to draw our attention towards the center. It kind of like and as well as what was in front and what was in the center was the most important <coughs> subject. Uh, and then uh, artists have started kind of like the the. Uh, art that have started to to challenge this this uh, this hierarchization of the canvas, that, that, that why should the middle of the canvas be the most important part of the canvas? And or the, the uh, so the, and kind of like that, that has been all the modern art movement that has started to use the all, kind of all over treatment where no part of the canvas left behind the type of approach where each moment are treated, each part of the canvas are treated equally and with the same attention and the same care. This is very something that I found quite that I've been rethinking about, and I find really important. Um, and and looking at Patrick Graham's work, I mean, like for example, there is that work. It's called uh, Stags, Not Mayo, and there is <laughs> two tiny gold pieces. I mean, like it's a tiny little triangle of gold on the two top corner of the painting. So the only other thing that is gold in the painting is mayo written. <coughs> Uh, and it just kind of felt like, yeah, I mean, this, the, 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 top, the top corners, we don't look at it. We don't pay attention to the top corner. I mean, at first it's too high, it's too far away. And uh, so I put the gold there. And uh, it's kind of like, so you have to look at it because like, that's the most precious things we have, that's gold. And so you have to look at that corner and spend time looking at that corner. So there was really, uh, I thought, 
as I was kind of like having all these thoughts about kind of like how we occupy the space and how we occupy the surface. And, uh, you know, like, and it kept kind of resonating with how <coughs> Graham has been using this space and how he, he, he plays with these hierarchies, with how, what we take for, uh, how we are supposed to, 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 to kind of like hierarchize and occupy that space and then and play against that and, and challenge our expectation. So I kept then after looking um, at all the, the what's happening on the sides, what's happening on the, on the so that, that's that I again kind of this notion of centrifugal I thought was was quite fascinating that that's kind of emptying out emptying out the center. Obviously, then there is all these resonance, resonances kind of being in Ireland, uh, the, the the periphery. I mean, like the, the uh, we've always kind of like the, the, the being on the periphery of the, the of kind of like the, of the of the center. So uh, playing and uh, charging the periphery, charging the margin, isn't that a way of kind of drawing attention? That that's where things happen. I mean, like there's been uh, quite a number of I can't. I think it's. Um, Mm, Terry Eagleton in his um, uh, writing on literature, English literature, and he was saying that all the great English writers were coming from the periphery, whether they were from rural areas or they were from, from Ireland or they were from wherever, uh, kind of a foreign, but they weren't from London, they weren't from the center, they were from all over. And so that the margin kind of is, is the one that feeds the center and that in effect the center is empty. And, and often obviously they come from Ireland, I mean like most of English literature <laughs> thanks to Irish writers. So, so there is, I mean you could, you could find kind of this, but there is a, a whole sort of theory of centers and margin and how, what's the dynamic between, between that, which I thought was, anyway, that's so kind of like, it, it kind of triggered all kind of ideas uh, around, around this. The, um, and at times there are figures in the work that, that occupy in a sort of central position. I'm thinking in the Lycan series, uh, the, I can't, uh, it's sort of, it's the boat, kind of the boat shape. Um, and strangely, that, 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 so it's, it's right in the center, it's occupied, it's like it, it is in the prime position, and it's dark. And it's, it's probably the least interesting part of the canvas. Everything else around is sort of teeming with details and life and, and elements of paintings. There is yellows and there is scratching and there's kind of all the drawings. But this, this is all kind of almost dull, that, that big uh, shape in the middle. So again, even though the center is not empty in this case, it feels like, again, the real story is happening around and, and in on the sides and on the margin. The, so that is kind of a, the, um, something else that I, um, and also, I mean, in his, in his treatment and in how the, the uh, kind of like, yeah, there are a number of motifs that I, I was quite attracted to. Uh, and that's kind of as well, sort of, I was kind of wondering how that fits into his way of looking at the world, like the, 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 the coast slip. There's a lot of co sleep in, in his work. And co sleep is kind of, well, I've, I was attracted to it as well because there's been a lot of talk about wildflowers lately, you know, like the, that wildflowers are much more useful than our garden variety and that we should pay more attention to the. Uh, so it was kind of like interesting that he will choose, you know, not a rose, not a lily, or not any of those kind of uh, well, uh, <laughs> kind of like uh, the. Uh, well-placed flowers, but the cowslip kind of like much more kind of uh, humble, uh, and uh, and how it recurs and how kind of the, 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 it's almost it becomes like in well in the cowslip painting that was there before, uh, it's it's really like a extremely graceful and elegant and kind of like one of the the, the, the most uh, gracious representation is actually doing in, in uh, when he feels like he's, he's trying to stay away from the representation, the co sleep just like stand there. And so it's just, again, so kind of this notion of attracting attention to something that is, uh, that is quite common or that it was humble, that is uh, the, so that kind of question of hierarchy and kind of looking at the, so there was kind of small elements like that in, um, uh, in, in the work that I, I found quite uh, endearing. And, uh, and obviously there is those two, Actually, they are not called both, but one is called self-portrait from 2020. And there is a sort of mirror image of figure in the landscape from 2021, which in many aspects look very much like each other. Uh, so I was very intrigued 
I expected to see self-portrait one, self-portrait two. But no, the second one is figure in the landscape. I, I thought that was kind of uh, intriguing. I mean, I like, I mean, I like words and I, I like relationship with titles and I can't, I mean, given the importance is, you know, that words are in his, um, in his work, I can't, you know, so you're kind of thinking about this, you know, like there is, and, and I do find that the, 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 the second one, well, which is figure in the landscape, uh, there is a sense that he has been more, almost kind of like more connected to, 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 to it's brighter to start with, there is less of a gloomy atmosphere, and, uh, and it feels like there is more of a connection with, uh, between, between that man holding these two flowers and uh, the sort of bright background. And, uh, and I'm just kind of thinking as well as, I'm just wondering, kind of following my own kind of uh, trend of thought, you know, like whether, you know, like just consider the self-portrait that's really placing the artist kind of as a single individual, whereas a figure in the landscape, it becomes part of, a, it becomes part of the wall, is not standing apart. Uh, it changes the perspective and the relationship. So I, I just kind of wondered, you know, like what was, what was the thinking behind the two different titles and how it has eventually changed how he, con he conceived himself in relation to, in re relation to his work or in relation to the, to, to the world around him. And uh, there, there is definitely something that's much brighter, I find, in the later work. Uh, probably my favorite. And so if, if you have a gift, uh, I take. Uh, it was and because as well it was it was both the one I prefer, but also uh, of what happened and and again the, the, going back to this, what happened when you're in a gallery that doesn't happen when you are you know, when you're kind of looking at digital images. So that the, the the lark lark in the morning, it's it's placed in the in the corridor just under the just kind of off the skylight, and as it happened, it was uh, um, sunny cloudy day, so I was standing in front of the, of the, of the painting, and uh, it kind of, it's, it's kind of gray-ish looking, and, and yeah, there are dots of colors, and, uh, but you know, like the overall impression was, and then the sun came out, and uh, the, because it, the, the skylight are just there, it, and it really picked up all the gold and yellow, and the, the kind of like the greens, and the whole, the whole painting, kind of activated, right, kind of, it was, you yeah, know, this kind of moments, you know, like, uh, suddenly it was, it was not gray at all anymore. It was like, because there is so much colors under the gray, and then suddenly, like, the light picked it up, so it was a really good idea to place it there. <laughs> uh, the, the, there was really some things that completely changed the painting there, and uh, the, so yeah, it was kind of like, I, I would have looked at it in the in the in the in, in the in the publication and not think twice about it. I, I, and this this was just kind of like and yeah, I kept coming back to it and then it clouded over, so I didn't. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Time flies. Sorry. Uh, okay. So um, so yeah, just kind of like uh, kind of break, get back to me because there was there was some things that kind of I felt. Um, or to bring that uh, to, um, we often feel when we are sitting here talking about art that we might might be a bit of escapism, that we might kind of that important things are happening out there, and why are we spending time talking about art? I mean, like things like uh, Boris Johnson is resigning, isn't he? Uh, no, more seriously, kind of like when with all the urgencies that are pressing on us, sometimes it feels like paying attention to art is a bit like yeah, escape from from thinking about and. There is nothing wrong with that either. Yet we all feel that there is something else that kind of, uh, and lately it has been going this this idea that um, that in uh, this idea of, of kind of like uh, that if if you pay attention to 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 for example looking to pay attention to every place on the canvas that uh, I'm, I'm, this is something um, now the, 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 the activist and writer Naomi Klein in, in the book this changes everything she talks about how progress has essentially relied on sacrificing places and people and it's always for the greater good and so that we can just kind of wipe out you know like the coal miner or this, this, this land or this because for the greater good and so I'm kind of thinking, what happened if we, 
in, in, in the changes that we have to make, if we take as our guiding principle that we should not sacrifice any place, that like the like that Graham is doing, you know, like that there is no place on the canvas that are being sacrificed, and that every piece, place, people have to be taken, given the same attention, and that, that completely change what we can do because there is all these things that we have to take in consideration, and uh, and it forces us. Uh, to, to, to rethink you know, and help us in, in making decisions how, how we produce energy and how, we, uh, kind of, uh, how do we maintain our, our, our life and how do, do, do we feed ourselves if no place is sacrificed, if no people is sacrificed, not dying of insecticide or not dying of poisoning because they're kind of like this, it's staying in the water and so on. So, yeah, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, Michaela has touched upon some of the really uh, central issues facing anybody who uh, claims the title of painter, certainly working, as I said, within, but also sometimes against the, uh, what we call the, the sort of Western tradition, and linking that across then to the specific painting figure and landscape. I think that the issue behind that painting is the issue of figure and ground, which is fundamentally about the issue of uh, uh, autonomy, I think, individual autonomy. So th thank you, Michaela. Can I just introduce Michael G. Cronin, who's a lecturer in English in uh, Maynooth University, and uh, Michael has published a couple of books with Manchester University Press on the interaction of sexual politics, literature, the Catholic Church, and the state. And later in 22, he published with Cork University Press, Anthony Serax, um, on sexual slash liberation. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and um, thanks to uh, Kato, Jessica, and Renee for the invitation to be here. I'm going to be writing a feature of literature novels, it's a really um, interesting and enriching experience to, to um, work and find a way of uh, speaking and thinking about uh, authentic popular literature. Also, I got to say the COVID uh, here for our weeks ago, but I'm sure this is very calm, so hopefully that won't uh, so, I'm going to this talk some um, uh, speculative reflections on the historical and political resonances of Patrick Graham's work, uh, specifically his art which emerged from a particular time and place, Ireland in the latter half of the 20th century to the beginning of the 21st century. So from my starting point, uh, we should acknowledge that Patrick Graham's response to his world is a very painterly response. And by that I mean two things. Firstly, his response to the world is mediated through paint on canvas, through the creative manipulation of paint on canvas. Now that's really, you know, obviously an our observation, but I feel it's worth making at the outset for this reason. And literary critics like me, or art critics, or cultural critics, strive for a politically engaged form of criticism, we can assume the role of spokesperson, as it were, for the artwork, assuming that the artwork, the poem, the novel, the painting, is meet until the critic translates its meaning into theoretical discourse. The artwork becomes, to use the appropriate image, a blank canvas or screen on which we project our political concerns and debates. But I believe that any purposeful, radical, politically engaged criticism must always begin with our encounter with the artwork, with that encounter that is at once aesthetic, emotional, and intellectual. And a painting is, in a sense, most radically critical, not by addressing issues, but by challenging us to our encounter with it to inhabit a mode of perception which those damaging binaries of modern modernity, thought and feeling, mind and body, which is itself the secular variation of the older distinction of mind and soul, of soul and body, are undermined. These distinctions are undermined when we encounter the work. Secondly, when I say that Patrick Graham's response to his world is history, I mean that it is mediated through his critical dialogue of the history of art, more specifically the history of European painting, 
We find in his paintings all the significant genres of Western painting, but refracted through Graham's distinctive vision. We find the constituent elements of those genres disassembled and reassembled. It is as if he's placed those elements into a kaleidoscope and shaken it. So, for instance, one is, when, as one enters the exhibition here at the gallery, one first sees figure and landscape. Interestingly, it's doubly framed. It's framed by the frame of the painting, and it's also framed by the doorway of the gallery. A very useful visual reminder that <coughs> painting works most powerfully by framing or reframing our perception of the world in new and startling ways. Along with his companion, Kayla mentioned this self-portrait, figure evokes the history of post-Renaissance portraiture. The development of portrait painting, most especially the self-portrait, Rembrandt and Angelica Kaufman, you can see one outside, to Lucy Freud and Cindy Sherman, was an exemplary cultural form for the elaboration of, but also the subversion of, the critical interrogation of, the emergence of the modern self, that is, our modern conception of subjectivity and personhood. The person defined by such characteristics as rationality, interiority, autonomy. Graham's portraits powerfully capture the tragic dialectic inherent to that modern conception of the self. The emergence of our modern idea of personhood greatly expanded human freedom. So, for instance, our modern ideas about human rights, with their origins in the 18th century uh, republicanism and revolution, rest on that idea of personhood. And at the same time, the emergence of modern conceptions of uh, personhood legitimized terrible new forms of exploitation and brutality. Colonialism, for instance. So, for instance, the intellectual rationalization of plantation slavery and its whole racial ideology, in which we are still so tragically admired, rested on it. Whiteness came to be a marker of personhood, blackness a marker of its lack or absence. In the Sheila and Gig series, we find the history of the nude in Western painting, more specifically the history of the female nude painted by the male painter. As a, for a brief digression here, I think we can also say that the Sheila and Gig series illustrate Graham's modernism and cosmopolitanism. To me, he seems like a painter who is working at the time when postmodernism is the cultural dominant, but what makes it interesting is that he is, I think, a modernist painting. So the Sheila and the Gig paintings, it seems to me, are modernist in the same way as Joyce Ulysses, about which you've heard a lot in the last six months. That is, reaching back imaginatively for pre-modern or archaic cultural forms and styles, so Homeric epic, in the case of Joyce, medieval sculpture, in the case of Graham, to innovate, to push uh, creatively at the boundaries of heritage forms, the novel painting. And they're cosmopolitan, I think, in the sense that any real or meaningful global perspective is always deeply rooted in one's immersion below. Through witty, provocative, distorted, disturbing images, for instance, the reimagining of the shade and the gate in male form in the painting activity, Graham inhabits, and also subverting, the history of the male gaze in European painting. His paintings illuminate for us how that gaze in art powerfully shaped, while also being shaped by, the patriarchal imagination. The patriarchal imagination in which a woman is never truly a subject, but always an object against which the masculine self defines itself, an object that is at once anxiously desired and objected. In Graham's Lacken series, we find the history of landscape painting. During the 20th century, the protocols of art education and criticism thoroughly devalued landscape painting. A bit like the Sheila McGee, Landscape painting came to seem archaic and outmoded, while bother when photography was invented, and worse came to be associated with the amateur. And of course, in our modern instrumentalized society, there is no greater insult than being marked as unprofessional. Ray's luminous renderings and paint of his spiritual encounters with the male landscape dismiss any simple minded proposition that painting is about the photographic depiction of the world as it is. The Latin series reminds us that painting is not about what is being seen, but, to borrow a famous phrase, ways of seeing. It's not about fields, but fields of vision. It's not about seeing the world as it is, but imagining the world as it might be. 
from the artist as critic, Wilde um, characteristically sums this up in a quip, life imitates art more than art imitates life. And then he illustrates it with a character um, recalling being called over to a window to admire a sunset and then being really disappointed because the sunset outside uh, looked like a second rate turner. <laughs> The other notable genre in the history of European painting we find reference in Graham's work is religious art. When you stand before these scenes from the life of Christ on the large canvases in the exhibition, you notice the dense texture of the paint, the dark, muddy palette, the overall effect of gloom and opacity. If the painting is impenetrable and confusing, that, it seems to me, is deliberate. The source of one's confusion does not lie in one's fault or untrained eye. On the contrary, it seems to me, uncertainty is the affective state which the painting strives for. The painting affirms one of the best known lines from Brian Quill's play translations confusion is not an ignoble condition. As we know from that comparing and moving interview with Pat Graham included in the exhibition, he grew up in a society dominated by conformity to a rigid, repressive, and oppressive fusion of conservative nationalism to Catholicism. He describes, for instance, the sadistic violence inflicted on children in the schools as a symptom of psychic damage which that ideology inflicted on its agents as much as its victims. As he describes, his childhood with his grandparents was emotionally cold. At the same time, as Grace reminded us this morning, as we now know from documentaries, personal testimony, and statutory reports, he had, in one way, a very lucky escape. As an orphan from a poor family, he was just the sort of boy to be confined to the horror of an industrial school or a formatory. It seems to me that scenes from Life of Christ offers an astute and unusual response to that history. Obviously, it does not respond by aiming to depict or represent those experiences directly, nor does it challenge that oppressive belief system by countering it with an alternative belief system. This is, after all, a painting. Its sphere is not concepts and beliefs, but sensations and feelings. Certainty at the level of feeling is, as it were, the affective substratum on which of, of, of rigid dogmatism at the level of ideas. So the painting undermines dogmatism and fundamentalism by undermining certainty. And it does that through effectively inducing confusion in its viewer by countering belief with doubt. Now, confusion and uncertainty may be thought of as negative or bad feelings, but at the same time, they can be thought of as hopeful feelings. Where there is uncertainty, there is openness. Nothing is fixed, so there is possibility. Out of the murky gloom and scenes from the of Christ, there are figures and forms struggling, as it were, to emerge and become visible. In the left-hand panel, there is a strange, mound-like shape that might be interpreted as a veiled and shrouded, kneeling human figure. Given the title and Graham's dialogue of the history of religious art, two possibilities present themselves. This could be the figure of Mary kneeling in an in an Annunciation scene, or being at the foot of the cross in a crucifixion scene. The middle panel I found most discombobulated. Initially, I read it as a scene of violence, frenzied energy, frenetic movement, a sense of struggle. Trying to understand this, I reflected in Greg's title and wondered if it was some part of the crucifixion story, the nailing to the cross, perhaps, or the scourging. But as I kept looking, the figures assembled themselves <clears throat> into a triangular shape with a smaller, swaddled figure in the center. Was this, in fact, an activity? Over the figure of the child, we call it a child for now, are heavy, rough strokes of brown paint crisscrossed. This could be a sort of crude version of the um, halo that we see in medieval art or in Eastern um, icons. But at the same time, they look like crossed swords. And so recalling the Shane the Gig series, I think this seems characteristic of Graham's work, subverting the linear clock time of rationalized modernity with this different temporal structure in which the beginning and the end of the story, the life, are collapsed into the same moment. And also the collapsing of such different affects, the hope and futurity symbolized by the baby, the brutal finality of the violent death. Which draws us then to the right hand of Hamlet, in which a figure, again only indistinctly human, sits higher than the other figures and seems to be attached to some structure, a pole or a tree perhaps. 
And again, there's the oddness of the different elements of a crucifixion scene, the kneeling mother in the left-hand panel, the crucified son in the right-hand panel, but then separated by the nativity in the center. The way in which these elements of the Christian myth seem to be struggling to emerge through the murkiness of the larger canvas can, I think anyway, be read as a metaphor for what the painting might be doing. That is, distinguishing between or separating out from each other two different conceptions and understandings of religious faith. One, religion as theology, a structured belief system, as dogma, and above all, as institution, and specifically, given Graham's life story, the Irish Catholic Church as a hierarchical and authoritarian institution of social control. And two, something that we might call religious feeling, something that does not necessarily depend on a belief system for its affective force as a response to real material conditions. As Marx observed, religious suffering is, at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Those of us raised as Christian, or indeed anyone with a kind of middle class secular upbringing, whether familiar with art, we become so familiar with that central image of Christianity, we no longer register its strange and unsettling affective, <coughs> symbolic, and political charge. The naked body of a young man, battered, brutalized, and broken by a fundamentalist religious authority and an exploitative imperial state. And I was thinking of this, watching Grace's, uh, the recording of Grace's extraordinary theatre work, the, 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 the married statue, and thinking about how for generations, I think I suppose my, grand, so my grandmother and my great grandmother, for them it was clear that. Marian devotion operated as an oppressive structure. This figure placed on the pedestal of this woman who was the ideal woman because she was somehow a virgin and a mother at the same time. So clearly operated, as I say, as part of an oppressive structure that kept women like my grandmother and great grandmother in their place. The men, for instance, they spend their lives working in farms, but they could never claim any ownership. At the same time, I know from my grandmother, the one who personally, and speculating about my great grandmother, who, for instance, buried her son when he was in his 30s. That's not how it felt to them. Yeah. To them, this figure of marrying devotion felt a slight source of solace and of comfort. And it was really one of the great challenges for us to get to grips with that. And I was writing, I think, um, Paul Meehan's poem. Uh, the statue of the Virgin of Granite speaks is probably the most powerful expression of that because this powerful feminist denunciation of Catholicism and patriarchy is enunciated by the figure from that ideology, the figure of the statue of the Virgin. Okay, so I'm going to swerve away a little bit from the paintings for a few minutes, talk about a more uh, conception of strong Okay. <clears throat> Feminist and gay lesbian social movements that emerged in Ireland in the 1970s constituted a broad struggle, fought in various fronts to assert the autonomy of individuals over their bodies and enhance their freedom. Necessary women were to the forefront, since the key issues had most immediate effect on their health, well being, and liberty. In the 1970s, this emergent social movement or group of social movements confronted a then, at that time, still dominant ideology, which combined capitalism with a fusion of Catholicism and conservative nationalism. As Declan reminded us this morning, since the post-famine decades of the mid-19th century, this ideological formation had placed an oppressive emphasis on controlling the body, the emotions, and all expressions of human sexual needs and pleasures. Controlling the body was deemed essential to controlling the social order. Now in the 21st century, two pillars of that ideological formation, which was dominant in Ireland from independence in the 70s, have been eroded and undermined. The authority of the Catholic Church as the arbiter of sexual morality and ethics and promoter of the social regulation of sexual conduct has been fundamentally challenged by progressive social movements, especially feminism, and simultaneously being undermined by its own institutional actions in covering up the sexual abuse of children. 
Likewise, the term of nationalism has to a large degree lost its hold over how we now imagine the imagined community of the Irish nation. But capitalism, the third pillar of that formation, is as dominant now as it has ever been in Irish history. We need look no further than the ongoing housing crisis to recognize how the rights of property still triumph over all human and social needs, just as it did in Patrick Graham's Hughes. And I'm thinking of uh, Grace's character, Lauren, her question, why does housing have to generate profit for somebody? And, and uh, I think the conventional phrase housing crisis is actually problematic because it suggests that there might be some way of organizing a housing market i.e. making this the human need for shelter monetizable and profitable that is somehow functional and not crisis free. Anyway, digression, sorry. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so then, in how to claim you, the social order was maintained through enforcing a normative ideal of the human that was characterized by repression, control, and shame. Now the social order is maintained through a different normative ideal of the human but when Brown characterizes as the entrepreneurial self. This does not mean that all aspects of our lives are expected to be directly monetized. We're not all expected to be entrepreneurs in the literal sense, but we are expected to conceptualize all aspects of our social and ethical conduct through the calculus of cost-benefit analysis, investment, and profit-seeking. We are expected to frame our lives through the lens provided by finance and economics. From employment and welfare to education and health, the contemporary citizen is insistently encouraged to conceive of themselves as wholly responsible for their own self care and rationally making choices to maximize the benefits accruing to them. But this rationally calculating individual must also bear sole responsibility for the consequence of their choices, regardless of the actual constraints on their freedom to act and choose. In this way, the effects of structure and qualities are translated into the failure to manage one's life successfully. And this judgment of failure is cast in moralizing, still, I think, moralizing in a different form, and medicalized rather than political terms. Philosopher Judith Butler argues that we can challenge this ideological dominant, the political rationality of new liberalism, by organizing around a transformed political vision which would not be premised on the autonomy and identity of the sovereign subject, but on the condition of vulnerability intrinsic to the human body. Confronting our bodily vulnerability is a visceral reminder that we are all born in a position of, rash, of radical dependency. Hence, the newly born infant is such an important symbolic image of that radical dependency. And here we can recall Graham's allusions to it. <coughs> Moreover, it's not that we overcome and move beyond that radical dependency as we grow and develop. In every moment of our lives, we only survive because of the resources necessary to sustain human life and to create conditions for human flourishing are made available to us by the ecosystem we inhabit and by the labor and love of other humans. It is not only that we are more dependent when newly born or aged, but also that the moments of our birth, the moments of our birth and our death again recalling Graham's life, which is collapsed, are the most clarifying reminders of the vulnerability and dependency which we always have. To mobilize around politically around human interdependence requires conceptualizing our consciousness, our sense of self, as relational rather than separative. Not relational in sort of conventional understanding of two autonomous selves entering into a relationship with each other. It's a different sense of the relationship. It's not I relating to you, but it's the profoundly unsettling and challenging realization that there is, in fact, no I prior to or independent of that relationship with you. To recognize vulnerability as ontological, as intrinsic to our human experience as such, is also to recognize vulnerability as political. In the capitalist world system, the distribution of corporeal vulnerability, degrees of exposure to violence, exploitation, and want is, to the very mildly, obscenely inequitable. And to recognize that we are radically dependent on the world's resources and on the labor of others is to confront how, in our current system, the extraction of those resources is recklessly destructive, and that labor is invariably alienated and punitively exploited. 
To figure the human body is vulnerable is therefore to figure that body dialectically. Vulnerability is the visceral mark of capitalist, capitalist exploitation, but it's also the visceral source of potential revolt against it. The human form in Patrick Graham's paintings creates a compelling aesthetic space for us to effectively encounter that vulnerability. In the images of religious suffering, in the strangely contorted, fragmented bodies of the Shin Week series, in the disconcertingly humanized shapes in the figure and landscape and self portrait. I've not met Pat Graham, but judging by his appearance in the recorded interview in the exhibition, it's clear that the figure, the center of self portrait, bears very little resemblance to him. In other words, the word self in the title there is not functioning as an adjective or a description, but as a provocation and an invitation. The painting is not asserting the individuality of this self, but questioning and interrogating what a self is and challenging us to do so too. It's a striking paradox. It's precisely to the degree that these humanite forms in the painting are not human in the conventional sense of being a recognizable individual that they work most powerfully to distill some essence of what it is to be human. Figure and landscape and self-portrait, as Michaela uh, pointed out, have a repeated pattern where the humanite form holds a flower in each hand. And our eye is drawn to this, as she was likely pointing out, drawing our attention to because the color of the flower petals is so luminously vivid in contrast with the relatively muted palette on the rest of the canvas. And I thought the, the, the blue of the corn flower and stuff forth is especially interesting. I find this interesting for two reasons. One, the flower offers an image of the relationship between vulnerability and strength, of vulnerability and strength. It is small, it is delicate, and yet, as the vividly intense color conveys, it is resilient. And secondly, that the humanite form as holy the flower reminds us of our radical dependence on the ecosystem we inhabit. We can't find out they are wildflowers, of course, and uh, the bees and the crucial role they play in. So the, the painting reminds us that destroying that ecosystem is to destroy ourselves, is to destroy the possibility of human life. And the floor of flowers floating around this humanite form also echo okay, the same characteristics floating across the Latin paintings. Again, a reminder that our relationship with the ecosystem we inhabit is fundamentally one of perception. Do we perceive the landscape instrumentally as a thing, a resource to be exploited and monetized, or do we strive to perceive the landscape in some other more holistic and sustainable way? And how, if at all, can landscape painting facilitate that shift of perception? In The Principle of Hope, which was first published in German in 1959, Ernst Bloch argued that hope is indispensable for any revolution in politics. Bloch argued that cultivating revolution in hope demands a different style of temporal reasoning than the linear, progressive time demanded by capitalism. This requires encountering the future as an open possibility. By being responsive to the revolutionary dreams of a transformed future, we inherit in the past. Here, um, again, the Grace's uh, theatre work um, reminds me very much of that very layered histories that she recalls. To be politically hopeful, Locke, is to be alert not just to what is, but also to be alert and sensitive to what he calls the not yet become and to the not yet conscious. The not yet conscious for Bloch is the creative capacity that allows us to anticipate the not yet become as an open possibility. Likewise, Bloch identified the necessity for the term guiding images of a liberated humanity. These guiding images of a liberated humanity help us to hopefully imagine what freedom might look like. For Bloch, a, gu a guiding image is a cultural figure or a type imaginatively embodying an idealized form of human subjectivity, one that we might aspire to, an imaginative realization of our potentialities. For all these reasons, Bloch argues art, by which he included all art, including liberation, or including literature, I should say, is essential to the cultivation of political hope. Bloch's contemporary fellow theorist of human liberation, Herbert Marcuse, 
also stressed the indispensable role of imagination and fantasy in striving to fulfill the potential to create a revolutionized form of consciousness and social relations. Art and literature provide imaginative projections of a freedom that can only yet exist in potential not realized form. We do not turn to art such as Patrick Brown's paintings for a description of our world as it is, nor do we turn to such art to find our social conflicts being addressed or to find resolutions to our political debates. Art like Patrick Brown's paintings does not provide solutions for our political dilemmas and our roadmaps for the political future, nor should we require to do so. What such art can provide are guiding images prompting us to, towards imagining less alienated more humane and sustainable ways of being human. Ways of imagining, in Marcuse's words, a mode of being that is absorbed all becoming, that is for and with itself in all otherness. Okay, well, the, there, as I said, there will be uh, time for questions and discussion afterwards. And, um, but the, this, this particular session will, will involve uh, Theo, Theo Gordon, uh, Jessica Taylor, and Anne Marie Newcastle uh, reading and then talking about the word in relation again as as happened already to uh, the Catholic program discussion and their sense of Catholic's hope. Their sense of uh, their sense of uh, Catholic's work and uh, so uh, all of the award winning uh, poets um, and I think representing sort of generational arc uh, of activity. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think I want to uh, take off, but I'm to start. Sure, I'm okay. excited to. Do you mind if I stop? It's very hard oh, to oh, when you were sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, Patrick Graham's uh, paintings are not always easy to look at. Uh, find them often angry, often barbed, often confusing. It's work that uh, disturbs and disrupts, and how fitting, perhaps, even essential, that we get to see this, this work in a serene, at peace gallery setting. Uh, to these paintings in the, in the quiet space of the Hugh Lane, to see these paintings in the quiet space of the Hugh Lane, is to see the heart still beating outside the body, or a horse tearing off straight down the middle of the motorway, or a violent rainstorm rolling in over the horizon in our direction. We want to look away, but we cannot. We look and look even though it seems dangerous, even though we may not want to feel the tension our looking causes on us, even though we do not want to face that conundrum of cruelty and beauty, and the mere slithery distance, also unbearably thin sometimes, that exists between both those worlds. How can it feel so pleasurable and yet be the scarred, fractured, furious thing? How can a painting or poem be at once so violent and so wondrous? And how dare the artist confound us like this? How dare they confront us? All last week, I was next door in the Irish Writing Centre mentoring a group of poets for the annual Singing Fly Summer School. And as we sat around a table together, one of the questions we began to consider is this question of how to transform difficult experiences into poetry 
how to bear witness in a poem to violence, what's also holding space for what might be joy or beauty or peace or truth. In our questioning, we looked towards the Irish poet Thomas McCarthy, a poet who writes of war and state histories and political unrest, but who also holds space in his poems for the glory of a garden or a love relationship or the grace of a bird in flight. In his poem Rebellion, which looks to the Great War, he writes, My betters have died for Ireland, but I prefer to remember Chiffon. I mean the sheer black chiffon gown that followed Ginger Rogers in the perfect revolution of her body. That time she was ambushed by an orchestra. It was her commandante in white tie and tails. That taskmaster and hated Fred Stair, who turned and turned as if bullets were heat-seeking and meant for him. In that poem, the dance persists. And yet the point is not that this moment of chiffon should diminish war or devastation. The point is maybe that an art as in life, both beauty and chaos can and do exist. As the summer school writers dwelled on that chiffon, which is a cloth of the morning and of seduction, we turned to the work of poet Audre Lorde, who in her essay uses of the erotic, the erotic as power, renders the erotic not merely as a plaything, but an empowering, sustaining life force, and a mirror by which we can hold all the various complex parts of ourselves even those which are most painful to the light. For Lord, the erotic has been banished or confined to the bedroom, but in our view, it is rooted in the acknowledgement of our deepest, oldest humanity, and in sharing that humanity, even when it's difficult for others to hear or to look at. And I quote from that Lord essay, our erotic knowledge empowers us becomes a lens through which we scrutinize all aspects of our existence, forcing us to evaluate those aspects honestly in terms of their relative meaning within our lives. And this is a grave responsibility projected from within each of us, not to settle for the convenient, the shoddy, the conventionally expected, not merely the safe. In the same essay, Lord writes, during World War II, we bought sealed plastic packets of white, uncolored margarine with a tiny, intense pellet of yellow coloring perched like a topaz just inside the clear skin of the bag. We would leave the margarine out for a while to soften, and then we would pinch the little pellet to break it inside the bag, releasing the yellowness of rich yellowness into the soft, pale mass of margarine. Then taking it carefully between our fingers, we would knead it gently back and forth over and over until the colour had spread throughout the whole pound bag of margarine, thoroughly colouring it. I find the erotic such a kernel within myself, she says, when released from its intense and constrained pellet, it flows through and colours my life with a kind of energy that heightens and synthesizes and strengthens all of my experience. That intense pellet of margarine, that dot of gold, so resonant of the painter's material, so resonant of McCarthy's chiffon, functions for me the same way that these Sheila and the gigs function within Graham's constellation of dense, layered, difficult works. It regards what Lord called the ancient and hidden, offering up an alternative narrative around the body, particularly the female body and sexuality. These Sheila and the Gigs operate for me in the same way that certain talismanic poems out of the Gaelic tradition operate in my own poetry practice when I'm writing about patriarchy, the institution, and the brutality of the Irish state. I'm thinking here of the 8th century ballad Dolo Og as translated by Lady Gregory, and of the sustaining erotic power that exists in this poem, handed down and handed down. 
a poem of burning and passion and fury that refuses to be dulled down or covered over. In that poem, the narrator says, my heart is as black as the blackness of the slow, or as the black coal that is on the smith's forge, or as the sole of a shoe left in white halls. It was you that put the darkness over my life. Patrick Graham's work, often raging and uncomfortable, speaks not only to the theme of despair, but to that of desire and of justice. Indeed, in an Irish arts great review, Graham once offered these thoughts himself. The ultimate tragedy of repression, he says, is the repression that it causes people who are oppressed. They repress their own humanity. Take religion, for example, which most people associate with truth. Religion in this country has tended to be a set of responses that serve to define the identity of the individual. To be Irish, you have to be Catholic. And if you adopt something like Catholicism as a structure for your life, you adopt its negative side as well as its positive. What goes worst of all is your brilliant humanity, the adventure of questioning, the adventure of the body. We've had no justice for our humanity. In conclusion and in conversation with the work titled Transfigurations, I'd like to close with a reading from my own collection, The Poison Glen, which is a book of both dark and light, a book that critiques the histories of the Irish state and the legacies of orphanages, state industrial schools, and mother and baby homes. And it's my hope that in doing so, it creates moments through which trauma can be transformed. At St Vincent's Industrial School, Golden Bridge, Dublin. Creed. I believe in the queer round window, in the queer white bird, watcher of bar and bolt, and in the child, my sister, my brother, who is conceived out of darkness in a moment of light and placed into the care of stone. Mother, father, these names belonged only to strangers. Weeping, the child escaped out from a cracking wall, was brought back in again, split open at the hip, and stitched up without pill or bam. The child descended into a dreamless state, and on the third day rose from the dormitory bed, hungry, swollen, wet to the skin. The child descended the stairwell, and on the first floor curled up like a dog torn apart by an angry dog at the right hand of the sister, for then the child shall be judged as living and as dead, I believe, in the chalk graffiti that reads, bad wolf rats out, in the caretaker who crosses the yard to ask, are you looking for someone? And in the cold wave that rises up through the body like a shot of lily to the bone, like a head full of frozen water, like a pillar of ice against a closed door, and in the communion of body and earth, the naming of sins, the resurrection of all the children of the nation cherished equally, and in the eye witness everlasting. Amen. <laughs> to be asked to, to come and engage in some way with the, with the work of Patrick Graham. And um, sometimes it's nice uh, to be taken out of your own art form and being given the luxury of coming into an area like the visual arts, of which I'm a huge fan of, but don't purport to know anything about. Um, so I, I enjoy coming to visit this exhibition a few times and trying to be my own impressions. Um, and I decided to respond poetically. Um, because I think that that's the area where I feel most comfortable existing in uncertainty. Um, and I think it's a form that lends itself very much to the kind of uncertainty uh, that we see, I think, sometimes in the, in the paintings of Patrick Graham. So usually we do the introduction first, and it's much longer than the poem, mm -hmm. and then the poem happens, and then we all go home. But today I'm going to read the poem first and then talk a little bit about uh, what on earth I was thinking of. She lies on the red bed. My mother's three faces fly out into tired morning light, 
her core like head untethered from its granite. Madonna of the grey dawn, stipple your rain onto the silvering places, the flattened landscapes I can never enter. When we lie together on this red bed, I become skinless. The world and all its light gets in, and I'm a paper lamp, blood galloping beneath my skin. My face melts into my torso, which I hold open for you, yellow bitter. Come and drink from me, you'll be dead long enough. The light permeates everything. Against its walls, bones quail and bodies spatchcock. In the darkest space, the heart, and tied to it, a bag to catch the loss. So coming across Patrick Graves' work for the first time, I was really intrigued by the struggle that he makes against ease and beauty. Um, and I think he talks about that really eloquently in, in his interview. Um, and I find that artistically really fascinating. You know, the notion that you have a kind of a facility that you need to work against it in some way. And I think that that's something we should all take to heart in our own work and practice. Um, but I think it's interesting how a rejection of the qualities of ease and, of ease and beauty allows them to manifest in really surprising ways. So these tortured religious scenes, this series of Shiva and gigs who seem always on the edge of being swallowed by their own vulvas. So they speak of anxiety, of alienation from the human form, and a kind of ritualized discomfort that I think brings us back to the religious iconography again. And I was very interested in how it felt as a woman to come and view these very distorted <coughs> uh, feminine and female images and how that violence made me feel. Um, and I think the figures in the work are, also, are, are very disturbing. Um, and I found my eyes drawn often, not necessarily to the, to the bulbs at the centre of the work, but to these weakened and twisted limbs and how the notion of reproduction and sex is somehow completely overtaking the body, weakening its extremities, taking away the ability to move or fly or change. And what is it I wondered about the revelation of sex and reproduction that commits this violence to the body in these images? The text within the pieces is really fascinating to me as a writer too, and often I find myself comforted by a moment of beautiful script and kind of peering out from these chaotic, ever-shifting landscapes. Um, and I think that the text often adds another really fascinating layer of reference, linking darker experience to Irish tropes that could be seen otherwise um, as comforting. And um, the painting called The Yellow Bitter, which I referenced in the poem, it assumes I think the humor of Cavalry with Illigula's ballad and just shows us the heart of darkness at the kernel of tropes of addiction. And again, this ritualized discomfort. And then there were the landscapes, uh, which were incredibly fascinating to me in how the landscapes in the series of images interact with the more kind of icon driven work. I think it's only in the landscape where kind of an uneasy peace seems to emerge. There's still places of difference, of alienation, and I was really intrigued in the interview to hear Patrick talking about specifically the challenge of capturing light. Uh, that very particular grey morning light you see in the desolate landscapes of the West. And it seems in a sense that in the work the landscape offers a comfort of kinds, a comfort of <coughs> unfolded, of being a natural <coughs> being within a natural space. But that the artist distrusts this somewhat as well. There is the idea of the landscape as something that can be inhabited, but that one aspect of the artist's self is always on the other side of the canvas peering through. And so writing my poem in response to Graham's work, I tried to exist, as I said at the beginning, in that same space of perhaps negative capability. Um, and what I think I took away from the work the most was the notion that uh, nothing is worth doing if it's too easy. Um, and I think Patrick Graham's practice really captures the sense of what can be achieved when difficulty is embraced. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, I have to start by saying I could cheerfully come in every day for a week and talk non stop for eight hours about this exhibition. <laughs> I did. It was extraordinary. You did 10 months. I know that. <laughs> I'm particularly well aware of that. I know I would be happier to shut me up than our beloved Terran. 
Uh, I, I want to congratulate Michael Dempsey on this show. I, mean, I think great gratitude to him, not just for the impeccable and challenging and fascinating way the show is assembled, but also for the title, which I presume you take it for Transfiguration. It's a word to dwell on and to think about for a very long time. I can find this down to very, 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 very small focus. Three, I want to share three moments with you. When I was five, I had scarlet fever. I was having feverish hallucinations or so-called hallucinations. And the one that terrified me was simply to find myself in the presence of an enormous, meaningless, blue-gray void. The void that is the other side of everything that exists. It was a direct perception, nothing that I've been told had prepared me for it. It was a direct, overwhelming, and convincing moment. Roll forward. Early 1970s, I worked as a builder's laborer in London every summer, but we set through college, where they go to the galleries on Saturday and Sunday. I'm in the Tate, I walk around the corner, there's a painter I've never heard of before, Tapiers, and only Tapiers, I did a big study of him afterwards. And we're looking at a painting about one meter by one meter, and the physical sensation was being punched in the stern, and I was instantly, unmistakably, 2,000 feet in the air, looking down at a part Spanish landscape. No question, that's where my entire self-aware consciousness was for that moment. And I floated back down, very gently, down, back to be standing in the only body I'd ever have, looking at a painting on a wall in a gallery in London. Third moment, this. I walk through this show of Barbara Dawson, and I'm walking, I'm looking at it, I'm staggering under what's coming in at me. It's enormous, like waterfall, small directions. And I come to this painting, and I'm back five, faced with the void. And I thought, this is a gesture made in the face of the void. And its power and its meaning is present in every painting, every piece of music, every poem that is of any value, which is to say that we choose collectively to keep as part of our human treasure. A sign made in the face of and in the spite of the void. The one question every poet, painter, musician has to face, can it avoid is, when do you lift your hand and let it go? Not the point is finished, the painting is finished, is when do you lift your hand and say, I have done what I can? I have not seen a single painting in this exhibition where I felt that Graham was entitled to lift his hand, his work was done. But I see every single painting in the show as a complete human gesture made in despite of, and maybe animated by, the one thing we all absolutely know. Every single one of us is going to die. We have our presence here in our beings, in our bodies, and in our artworks, in the complete knowledge that we will vanish. There will be a moment when we are no longer here. Now, to give something on into that future where you will not be present is one of the duties of the artist. And when I say duty, I mean it emerges viscerally from your very phenomenological sense of existing. I say constantly, and everybody thinks I'm being figurative. I do not write the poems, the poems write me. Every single painting in this show that I could see persuades me of the merit and value and glory of Paddy Graham because every single one of them is a completed gesture. He has fulfilled his duty to the work, to each individual work. And the duty is called up, in some sense, by the work itself. And we could have a little seminar on Husserl, and we could have another seminar on Gaston Bachelard and establish all of these, the uh, phenomenological states of this art. But I can't be doing that. I won't be let anyway, and quite rightly, there is some time. But I want to say that every behind every point I've ever made in my life is the void. 
and ahead of me is a void, an unknowable, where I will not be present. So why do I make points? Why does Patty make paintings? Why do Anne-Marie and Jesse make such very, very fine points? Because the poems make themselves truly. They speak an imperative. It is a response to an imperative. Now, that's all I'm going to say. My father worked in a factory all his life. His one wish for all of his children, all 15 of us, was that we would get the best education we could possibly get and then do what we wanted with our lives. My mother had also worked in the factory. She had the same. Let you be yourselves. To be yourselves. But I know that what I do is useless. It's actually useless. There is no practical value. I can't, my politics cannot be brought into being through my voice. I can be a witness to my politics, but I cannot shift the political domain with a board. I cannot sweep the floor, I cannot put bread on the table with a board. In that sense, that's the sense for which it's useless. But Michael mentioned Pope Marx on Hope, um, Theodos and Megara say in 500 BC, Hope is the one good God remaining. So every painting, Every poem, every piece of music that anyone has ever made is made in the hope that it will augment and strengthen and give heart to and maybe express some meaning to absolutely unknown people. All those who are alive at the same time as us, all of them, almost all of them we will never know, but also the generations unborn. There is a reason why tyrants fear and murder poets. There is a very good reason why tyrants who know power better than anybody else is, why they fear poets. They fear poets because poets make poems, and poems and paintings and music are irreducible and cannot be suborned. You can try it, but they will always be for you. Each poem is a small universe made in despite of the void, and maybe rooted in the void. But many years ago, when I was a much younger man, I wrote a poem to my father. I'm going to read that now. Out of the void, in full knowledge that what I make is entirely useless, and maybe that's its usefulness. And it's just a gesture, a handshake across the void. To the most admirable artist, Pedro, speaking to my father. How should I now call up that man, my father, who year after weary year went off to work, buried his heart beneath the weight of duty, buried himself early so that we might live. How should I sit here and explain to his shade, yes, this is the work I do, you die for. This is the use I make of all that sacrifice. I move the words as you moved heavy tires. True, there is no sickening stench of rubber, no heat from the curing pants, no rage at management choked back by need as much as pride, the father, the range of uselessness is wide. Often as I grew slowly, you let slip a word, a helpless gesture, or a look that shook me to the roots. I'd sense the void you stormily, heroically sweated back. Above all, now I have everything you lacked. Above all, freedom to shape the workload for the day. Sounds like freedom, doesn't it? The truth is, I hate the shift work just as much as you do. <laughs> there are days lately as I thicken in years when I feel your sinews shift inside my frame. I catch it up of yours in the mirror, shaking, mild, skeptical, weary, a bit resigned, but something else too. Your athlete's way of planting the feet carefully when troubled. Shoulders square to the blow that may come, ready and fit to defend what you hold dear. What troubled you most? The question shies away when I stand with my pen, clumsy as ever. I don't even rightly know what troubles me. Ignorant is when I rode upon your knee. What would you make me, I wonder, sitting here long after midnight, searching for the words to bring you back, 
soliciting the comfort of your shade for the odd, useless creature that you made. Here is the end of all that education. The void is as close to me as it ever was to you. I make points as you and Rose made children, blindly, because I must. Father, comrade, the same anger with the world but not your patience fools me. I make you this, a toy in words, to reintroduce myself and to ask, what must I do to be your child again? So I thank you. Is it a shared idea? Is it is in terms of each of your uh, practices? It's a, it's a tough one, really. I don't know. I mean, I certainly feel there's a there's a kind of an imperative there, which is which is hard to hard to articulate in any other way. You know, a, a drive to try and capture something or or write something, or or again, as I was saying, to exist in that kind of negative capability and uncertainty. So I think it's very much a, a tool that I would use to process the world around me, and I'd be lost without it. I'm not sure if that's exactly the same thing, but yeah, it definitely, yeah. I think it's closely related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like you can turn up to the desk and um, be there, <laughs> and be in the practice of reading and writing and gathering notes and um, have all the channels open. And then maybe there is something in that, the good poems, they come, you know, it's, they kind of bubble up from the subconscious or they, they kind of come in like a flame kind of coming forth. So it's a bit of both for me. I think, <coughs> really, I, think I agree with what Theo says that um, when it's happening, <laughs> yeah. uh, something that you're not fully in control of mm -hmm. is happening. And yet, to be ready for that, you have to be in the discipline and the practice as well. Well, you have to set it up, don't you? You have to And you have to be ready for it. Yeah. Um, when when Mikis Theodorakis was asked to write the music for Omelos, the, the Greek translation of Bien's The Hostage, he was sitting in a car reading the poems of uh, Seferis in the rain, and he said 17 sounds bubbled up in him. There are 17 sounds. He said they just came right up through him. Now the thing is, if he wasn't skilled, if he didn't have the mastery of his art, they would come through and gone on. Yeah. So you would have to trap. But I, I will say, and I have, I have lost friends already, and I may lose some in this room today by saying it, there was an ancient distinction between poetry and verse, which is a very honourable distinction. And verse is a very honourable profession, and a very honourable art form, but it is governed by will and practice. Poetry is other. We talk about uh, you know re recuperating the other socially and politically. There is an other where we all of us sense that otherness, the otherness of being. To think that the, the plane of being is confined to the little narrow spectrum that humans inhabit is a profound arrogance. It's possibly the origin of capitalism, in fact. You know, I can hold this. Trees speak. Rose speak. This is why the Orphic myth is so supposed. Everything in the plane of existence speaks itself. It articulates itself. And I think that poetry, a poem as distinct from a verse, is something that inexplicably perhaps links straight through that at other. And when you say to yourself at two o'clock in the morning, it makes the hair stand up in the back of your neck. You know? And it's unfortunate, I think, that we have devalued verse and in a sense overvalued poetry by calling poetry a lot of work that is first class verse. You know? It's like, um, you know, anyone can paint a table and you can study and learn to paint it and you can do a beautiful thing or an unsettling version. But you can't make Kylie's poem table because somehow something in him comes through there and the terror of the void and the basic simplicity, simplicity existence of the table are contained in some sort of I could go to the whole exhibition and say the same thing. 
The, probably the most useful thing to say is, um, you know, what do you take with you when it's time to pull out and the house is on fire and you're heading for the door and you've got a thousand paintings or a thousand points on it? Ask yourself always, what are the ones you'd go for? What are the ones you would keep? The, the second-hand bookshops are full of five-volume collected poems. They're absolute rubbish, but they were bestsellers in their time, and they were cried out by the critics, and they were the, they were the, the, the moment of jour, they were the, the, the fashion of the moment. You have to learn how to mine the gold. You know? And to me, the gold is that, the one that speaks of other, otherness, otherware, the other self. The joy of art, for me, is it gives me many lives, not just the day to day. My father had went eight hours a day into a factory, into a head of Dunlop's tire factory, and came out and went to his garden. The man in the factory was not the man in the garden. Because he'd sold, he'd have to, he voluntarily sold himself to the producers, right? But we, had, we loved the garden. And I love the paintings, and I love all of the paintings that are in this building. Because I am not a prisoner, I'm not a slave, as long as I'm free to be in those places, to be in those imaginations, to feel that communion of imagination. You know? I'm talking too much, aren't I? I, I do this. <laughs> well, because time is running out. I have to get, just have get it all said before I vanish. But I, I mean, in a way. I'll make these young points here. In a way, art, whether it's poem or painting, is proof of existence. And we exchange proof of existence for the means of existence. And that's as valid as somebody, with all the respect in the world, that has to work in a tariff oh, yeah. for the means of existence. That doesn't have to apologize for No, exactly. That's, that's yeah. really the point. Yeah. I'm, I'm conscious of time again, um, but um, would anybody like to ask a question, make a comment, discuss any of the, the very rich contributions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Declan? Yes, you do. Would you mind if I ask Michael one of why Transfiguration? Why you chose that as the title of the show? I think that's a good Okay, okay, that's a question. Is that okay? Yeah, sorry. If Michael and Grace and Michael could come up. Yeah. This Michael can speak for the. There's a mic for everyone. Such a powerful word. 
It's 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 taken also from the religious, yes. which he, he he also always brought into the work his um, understanding of that religious thing. But but it's it, there's so many layers to it as well. It's like about like figuring landscape and transfiguration then becomes the obvious. And, and, and better so than Kenneth, because Grace, your transfiguration of the Virgin, mm -hmm. and you know it's that, and and like you were saying. I mean, my mother, one of our neighbours says me about meeting my mother once, marching down to Blackpool Church. So we're going to say, I'm going to get that one a piece of my mind. He said, I need shoes for the twins and I have got the money. <laughs> and, you know, people had that relationship with them and the, the softening of the, the, the dark Christian ethic by the mother. You know, I mean, you can take it back to matriarchal cultures, the Bronze Age and the Eastern Age, and you know, you can roll it back there to the idea that somehow you can appeal to the mother. And that kind of transfiguration. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the joys of, of, of contemporary poetry is so many women's voices have come through in, in a remarkably short space of time when you consider the period of time when they were occluded and suppressed. But the variety of those voices and the transfiguration for the reader, for the male reader especially, to read constantly into so many different um, psychic appropriations yeah. of the world. Yeah. It's, 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 it's joyous. It's also so there's alchemy there as well, yes. transfiguration of material. Yes. Yes. And what you were saying about um, that sense of coming to the desk as a writer and waiting and creating the, uh, the conditions for, for it to come to you. So you talk, uh, uh, I think Paddy talks about going to sweep the floor, he's got the cleanest studio I've ever seen. Um, and so it's, it's about being there, being there yeah. every day, waiting, waiting. And the other point I'd make is, uh, is also about, <laughs> it, this is the paradox, I suppose, uh, in that you have to be there for the event of when you're not there. There's a, there's a sense of when you aren't there and it's being made, it's being made through you. So mm -hmm. again, you've already said it in a, in a much more elegant way. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to uh, bring in the, the, the audience now if anybody wants to uh, ask a question of any of the speakers or just make a comment or your own response to the exhibition and the material in the exhibition. I, I thought it was fascinating and um, to hear the views of people who weren't familiar and um, being Michael and um, who, who didn't know Paddy and um, say so Michael I yes. don't think I would know him very very well for a long time. But it, it's very interesting to hear how people picked up on things that we would know that are very personal. <coughs> so there were various, I mean, say if you take flowers, they've taken on this universal being and people with the environment and fragility of them. And, but for Paddy, they also have a much more uh, personal connection because he was raised by his grandparents in a nursery. And one of his jobs as a child, and you often see in some of the, uh, the drawings, not only the series there below, but to see the seed pads that have been cut out, and he inserts these in. Because one of his jobs as a, as a kid was to go to the post office and post these seeds all over the world, because his grandfather was one of the first kind of seed savers. Um, and it's remarkable now that this has become a, you know, a fashionable kind of thing to do and a, a necessary thing to do, to save these rare seeds, but the grandfather was doing it whatever, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. But there are loads of little things like that, that it's great to see that they, as Michael said, that all of these um, things that become universal are very much you know, centered in the local. So I love it. It's always good yeah. to get a completely different perspective, but obviously one that's coming, you know, a sense of uh, poetry and searching for it. But forgive the pun, but uh, really interesting artists sow the seeds for those responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it almost literally in the case yeah. of the seed packets and the flowers and so forth. But uh, I, I know in discussions, you know, as a cur curator, and you'd be everybody would have done it in the curatorial role of having curated an exhibition and taking people around it, that you often get asked the question, what does it mean? 
and my answer is always, well, uh, we know we're, we're, in a sense, the seeds in Florida mean something for Paddy. So he invests the work on his side of the deal, as it were, of the bargain for the encounters. He, he is investing that. <coughs> um, but the question for the viewer, for the reader, is what do you mean by it, by the experience you're about to have? And that's what really interesting art does. It sets it up so that the viewer can, through the encounter, uh, create their own value in the experience. And that can be done on an individual scale, or actually quite on a much larger scale as well. You know, but it's so. It's, what do you mean by it? We now know what Paddy means in a sense. This sort of <coughs> auto, autobiographical note. What about the hardest thing to show together is actually dealing with individual and great. Yeah. Because it's always the story is always biographical. It comes out of when you're trying to get a sense of what the work is, you get a biographical story. So to get an objective story yeah. is, is is what I see a great value of poetry today. Yeah, well there is no innocent space, there's no neutral space where something means one thing. Exactly, yeah. And it's tied yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's tied, usually it's tied, usually it's tied to the individual. So you know I was biographical in art history, but you know, a lot of a, a lot of artists by um, the, the biographies of the artists, everybody looks at oh, what does this mean? Yeah, yeah. And this means this because when he was a child this, this happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, we need to get beyond that. Yeah. And with Paddy it's particularly difficult because he's he's uh, a much beloved sort of local we know him so well. Yeah. Uh, to get him onto that international perspective is much less. Yeah. It's an interesting how time deals with that though. Yeah. That you know, once the um, the it's like the booster stage, the actual life and the, the, the life in 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 shared time of the artist is kind of a booster stage, and the work is projected out into an unknown future where people will not understand where he came. They won't need to know. They may not know at all, and yet somehow the work produces an impact and a meaning. And I think it's also the importance of, and this is not confined to public galleries, but it is generally more available in the public gallery system than in the private gallery system, and that is that the opportunity to see a, a wide range of work. This is an unusually large exhibition uh, with a real commitment to showing uh, the wide range of paintings, and as I've said earlier, in terms of my personal response, the works on paper and the drawings, a large number of works on paper, not as an ancillary process, but as a fundamentally a sort of spinal column to the, the whole process itself. Um, and that, that's the importance, it seems to me, of uh, the public domain in, in what we could call the gallery system and so forth, you know, because that that is a, 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 a hugely important platform on which everything else is built, it seems to me. And I, I think that's what allows for the sort of the really rich responses, yeah. and uh, if, if not sort of direct interpretations, although there have been some direct interpretations of individual works and so forth, I think just bouncing off the work mm -hmm. in terms of one's own practices, as, as Grace did, and seeing how the rela <coughs> relational process works right across media and so forth. Mm -hmm. But again, anybody else from the audience? I'll pick on somebody if. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it has been pretty overwhelming, actually, this morning has been so rich, it's uh, uh, simply, uh, Thank you. One strong. thing, I, I'm interested to know what you think, because you know you have such an enormous history of working with so many different kind of things. The idea of feeling as meaning, you know, in the culture we distinguish between feeling and meaning as if they're separate things. Mm -hmm. well, what you feel from these paintings is an intrinsic part of its meaning. I mean, you, you have a very wide frame of reference. I mean, well, I, I, you, is that universal? I, well, with really interesting art, it, it, it's universal. Uh, and it, but it, the distinction between feeling and emotion, mm. there's a, there is a distinction mm. uh, in those spaces. Um, and I would say that uh, really interesting work, and I think we make a mistake, that this is one of the problems that the visual arts has, and painting has in particular, and that is that a, a visitor to a museum or in any space where you see a painting, you optically receive the image in a split second. <clears throat> and there is an expectation that the meaning will somehow and should be revealed yeah. in the same time frame. Yeah. And uh, one of the responses to that in the 70s, looking at an old cohort, historical seminar, 
was the introduction of time in the making and experience of work which video technologies allowed for, which painting didn't appear to allow for. Yeah. But actually, and, th and this is why one of the reasons I really enjoyed curating exhibitions in the Kamena building in the Royal Hospital was that because the room structure meant you could put one painting, tiny or large scale there, in a room, and it wouldn't look odd somehow. Um, and you were, you were inviting people to spend time. Exactly. And feeling comfortable, comfortable spending time. No, you don't. You, you, know, you, you have to take at least three minutes to listen to a Westlife record yeah. before you decide that it's yeah. good or bad. I don't know. Without comment? Without comment? Without comment. Without comment. No, but you know, they're I kind know. Of, no, the average, uh, you know, we all, don't, we all don't the surveys and galleries that people spend 0.5 of a second in front of any individual work. Uh, and mostly they, they get, we all get the, the gallery museum shuffle, which is why people get really tired, which is why they leave the coffee shop. Yeah. And it's, uh, but there's a process, and I think we should be, well, often we should empty, but well, I'm just arguing for... professors were as guilty as that, as well. No, I did, yes. but I, you know, when because you have an argue for populating the, a, a gallery with large scale yeah. works, every now and then it would be very interesting to empty a gallery and leave maybe one work in the space. Yeah. And, and an open invitation for people to spend yeah. time with a single work. Mm -hmm. But that idea that painting can deliver its meaning, like our art forms, you know, it takes X number of minutes to be the poem. I think a know, life to you understand. An observation really on, because of the luxury of, of when we're closed on Mondays, the galleries are open for me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I get to spend a lot of time in these spaces by myself. Yeah. And walking through the galleries, you, 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 you'll pass paintings. This is what I'm talking about Patty's gentleman. And you, you won't even look at them mm. because they're just there on the wall and they don't stay on the team. And you'll turn a corner and one painting on that day, on that journey, might just open up whatever it is in the book. The light, the way it was um, when it hit. Mm. There are moments when a painting <coughs> speaks to you, it opens up mm. for some reason, for whatever the conditions are, and then you have that community. Uh, but most of the time, I find. But the, the Quakers have a wonderful phrase in terms of which bits of the Bible should you follow? You know, Old Testament, New Testament, Book of, whatever. And they have a great phrase which is, if it speaks to your condition. Mm -hmm. And what that allows for is your condition to change. Mm -hmm. So it might take you a lifetime before you actually get yeah. Yeah. a paragraph yeah. painting or a poem or, or whatever. And so it should, yeah. maybe. But it's, it's, a, it's a continuation, and this is where you get into the uh, politics of the public domain, <coughs> enforcing the public domain, and sustaining the public domain, is cre uh, creating and uh, continuing the opportunities for those possibilities to exist for the widest possible range. And for future generations to school children to bunk in there. And absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and you can Ray Ray and Paula yeah. Mayhem, who used to and do that you, all the time as well, she used to bunk in there. But that thing is very important because there, there have been and will be debates about admission charges to gangs. And without dropping everything down to that issue, it is part of the same process. And all of this is actually political because it's about power relations and who has the power, who has access to the power, and on whose behalf the power is being used for what purpose. And I actually would argue that public gallery system, free admission and so forth, is one of the embodiments of a set of values which are crucially important. Right now, in the face of the colonization, the recolonization, the attempt at a new colonialism that is going on, absolutely, very raw and visible, say, in recent developments in the United States in social policy, but present present here as well. Sorry, I'm supposed to be chairing this. Yes, I'm supposed to be doing this. All the talking. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was kind of, when you were talking about, I mean, like, how, you know, yeah, both to sit at the table and, and walk, and, and, and it comes, but it comes because of the walk, and that's, I would say, as well, it's kind of like, when it comes, if you're not, if you haven't done the walk, it, yeah. it, but the viewership is exactly the same. It's like, you have to do the work, you have to look at the work, spend time. And then eventually, there is that moment. There is that, uh, but most of the time it's going to be like hard, looking, spending time and effort. 
and, and then there is those moments. So it's a kind of a certain sort of discipline, you know, like you have to put in the work yes, yes. as a viewer, just as always, as better. Um, we're just coming up to one o'clock, and I do think we have to draw to a close now. So, can I thank all of the fantastic speakers who have contributed today? I think it's been a really rich experience. Can I thank Q Lane for the Paddy Graham exhibition? Can I thank Paddy Graham for being the artist he is? Um, and thank Jessica and the team uh, for organising today's event. And especially thank you all for attending uh, this study morning. Thank you very much.